I brought three very everyday objects, um, prosaic objects, but for me they're objects which are invested with an enormous amount of um, significance, both because they're my working tools and also they are a point in a very long continuous series of working tools for scholars and scientists since at least the Renaissance. So what they are, are notebooks, plain ordinary notebooks of the sort that you could get in any stationer's shop. Um, and uh, the plainest of all of them, and you'll notice it's the only one that doesn't have a picture on the front, um, is the first one which I started keeping when I was a graduate student at Harvard working on my dissertation. And it's simply a notebook of everything that I read. Um, and I noticed that on the first page is my address not only in Cambridge, Massachusetts, but also in Paris, where I was doing archival research. Um, these notes, in a handwriting which I barely recognize because it's so neat, um, these notes were the beginning for me of not only a scholarly career, but a form of research which involves immersion in texts of all kinds, um, but then the process of digesting these texts and making a narrative out of them. The images on the books help me remember what I was working on and when I was working on it. So although I index my notes afterwards, all the pages are numbered, um, and then I do use the computer to index them in terms of sources. When I'm thinking about themes, knowing where to look is guided by the pictures on the cover. They are um, the most valuable thing that I own because they themselves are the crystallized labor of decades. Um, uh, and they bear with them the traces of all the libraries and archives in which I've worked. Um, the places where every historian feels most at home. The exciting thing about it is, I sometimes go back all the way back, all the way back to when I first kept the notebooks, and reading what I then took notes on is suddenly transformed by putting it in the context of what I've learned since. So it is a repetition of the whole process of history and the reason why history has to be rewritten in every generation, not because the things that past historians have found out were false, they're not false, but they take on new meaning when they're put in new context and that happens in miniature, a kind of dollhouse scale, every time I go back to the old notebooks. When I have to write something, what I do is to go through the notes, and this is a moment of intense pleasure in working. I go through all the notes, and I start to make an index by themes. And that's the moment at which the pattern begins to emerge out of all of the raw materials that one has gathered over months and years. Um, and it's both fascinating, but also somehow moving to me when I go to an archive and look at an observation notebook by a naturalist from, let us say, 18th century Geneva, and I see that he's done the very same thing. So that his daily notes, I'm thinking of the um, notebook of Horace Benedict de Chaussure, his daily notes, for example, of Ascending Mont Blanc, are written in pencil. They're almost impossible to read because he's taking them on the spot. The weather conditions are adverse. He's mounted on a balky mule. He's carrying thermometers, barometers, and other instruments. But on Sunday, when he had a moment to rest, he took up a quill pen and wrote in ink. In far better handwriting, he looked over his notes and looked for the patterns. He made a kind of distillation of all the things that he had observed, the snowfall, the color of the sky, um, the sediments of rock that he'd seen, and began to try and detect the patterns. So nobody starts out, goes to university saying, I want to be an historian of science. All historians of science started studying something entirely different and wander into the field, and I also wandered into the field. I thought I was going to be an astronomer when I first began my university studies, and again, by sheer good luck, 
um, the professor who taught the introductory astronomy class was an astro a solar astronomer. He was an astronomer, but he also had a very serious interest in the history of his field. His name was Owen Gingrich, and he is still indeed publishing um, wonderful books in the history of astronomy. And so he taught this introductory course in astronomy as a history of astronomy. Um, and after that, I was hooked. Uh, and uh, the great thing about the history of science is that because it's always had very permeable boundaries, um, it's always been very receptive to people coming from outside. Otherwise, it would, it would, it would wither away and die for lack of recruitment. And moreover, it's always been extremely interested in the perspectives of working scientists, in the perspectives of philosophers, sociologists, anthropologists, um, that um, it's, it's very hospitable. Um, and it's, very, it's a very good discipline for people who couldn't ever make up their minds about what they liked most, the sciences or the humanities or the social sciences, um, because it's possible to combine all those perspectives within the history of science. It's a very undisciplined discipline. It's full of men in textbooks. It's full of women elsewhere. And so um, if you look indeed at encyclopedias, dictionaries, um, textbooks, um, all of the receptacles of the official histories of a science, yes, it's full of men. Um, and there's no doubt that they have been the public face of science. But there's also a private face of science. Um, there are not only the exceptional women, for example, um, um, Marie Agnese, who was a professor of mathematics in the 17th century in Bologna, um, so exceptional women, or Laura Bassi, who was a member of the Bolognese Academy of Sciences as a physicist in the 18th century. There are those exceptional women, but there are legions of women um, who simply worked with a family unit to do science. So, for example, astronomy. Astronomy is a science where you have to stay up all night. Um, it's a, a science which requires, especially after you have instruments, requires at least two people because one person has to keep his or her eyes dark adapted to observe the sky, and the other has to, by candlelight at least, be writing down the observations. Um, so you've got to have a team. The team for most of the world's history and most of the world's culture is the family. That is the unit of labor, of, of production, um, and it's no different for astronomy. So astronomers' families were all enlisted. Not just astronomers' families. Um, when Thea de Mommsen, the great Berlin um, ancient historian, began the Corpus Inscriptionum Latinarum, as soon as his almost, I think, a dozen children had learned the alphabet, they were put to work, filing at least. So if our conception of who a scientist is is determined by who has a university chair as something that looks like a university, yes, it will look very male. But if you expand your notion of who a scientist is and where they work, then it doesn't look so homogeneous. I've gone through this now twice. Um, first in the United States, when I first started teaching at Princeton and at Harvard in the 1980s, and then when I came here, because Germany was a good 15 years behind, frankly, the integration of women. Um, in the workplace. Um, and yes, I did find it difficult. Um, I was, I encountered a degree of um, prejudice here which I never encountered quite so brutally and frontally in the United States. Again, because at least there is, a, even if the reality is um, something else entirely, there is a rhetoric of equality which is potent, even if it's, it's never merely a rhetoric. A rhetoric um, has a normative tug to it. And if people can be made to see that they're in violation of their own rhetoric, there is a possibility for, for blaming and shaming, but more importantly, for change. If there doesn't even exist the rhetoric of equality, um, you are on very marshy ground indeed. Um, and that is certainly what I encountered here. When I arrived um, in 1995, I believe there were only five directors in the entire Max Planck Gesellschaft. Three of us were foreigners, um, which says something about the relationships um, 
um, between men and women in academia um, in, in, in an entire spectrum of ways, um, and ways which I think were very, very seldom consciously discriminatory, which makes them all the more dangerous. So let me give you just a few examples. Um, and I witnessed this, I, I really kept statistics on this. Um, so colloquia, um, a speaker comes and gives a talk, discussion ensues thereafter. Um, someone asks um, the question, the key question that reorients all discussion thereafter. Um, let us say that the person who asked this question is Joanna. In the discussion afterwards, at some point, people refer back to this key question, and instead of saying, as Johanna asked, they say, as Michael asked. Michael is completely astonished. He, he has no consciousness that he has this question. But the attribution of the key question um, migrates in a statistically significant way to um, what is considered to be a more appropriate bearer of the key question. So, you know, it, it would be um, grandiose to say that, um, first of all, that I suffered from this as much as younger women scholars did. I was in a very privileged position coming, and yet I too, um, I, the most amazing thing about this is that in a very hierarchical arrangement where I had been granted um, a fair amount of power and prestige, even then it was insufficient to overcome these unconscious habits. So, for, But the first thing is to say that um, I was in a very privileged position. Um, the second is, um, once you make most people conscious, and that's why the statistics are so useful of this, they themselves are astonished, and they start to observe themselves. And I really don't think that in many, most cases there was malice aforethought. It was simply a reflex. If you point out such errors, people usually are in a position, if they're of good will, to correct them. And the, the happy truth is that most people are of good will um, and they are um, willing to correct them. Um, but I think the only other, and probably the most important, um, tactic one has, it's not even a tactic, it's a way of life, is ignore it. Do your work, do good work, and um, that can't be ignored.